Okay. Does everyone have everything? I'll assume so, and we'll just move along here. Uh, just a couple of important things we want to say about what you have in your hands. What you have in your hands. We take, uh, <coughs> take some substantial time for you to collate. Um, I want to start with... Um, this page on the salvation and the finished work of Christ, 68 things accomplished at the point of salvation. Has anyone received this from another class? 68 things? Okay, well, if you have two copies, you're twice as blessed. Um, this is... Uh, this is something that kind of makes, is like the backbone of our of our ministry, and uh, this, this can be and should be a permanent um, resource reference for you from here to four. Um, it is also available under digital doctrine, so there is electronic uh, availability for that. The salvation, uh, yeah, 68 things, actually and the additional up to 95. Okay. Um, atonement, redemption, propitiation, and regeneration. Four pages, four topics. Those are gratis by Lewis Berry Chafer, the uh, seven volume. Very few folks have those. There's, I believe there's a set in the library, but don't worry about it because you now have what you have need of for this class. But uh, this is extremely helpful, vital, important, relevant, all the above. Okay. Um, now, talking about, and here we are, <clears throat> And we're really going to sink our teeth in here during the, this class and the next class as there is sufficient material to go over and take two classes to do this. The doctrine of salvation, soteriology as theologians would call it, is huge. But you know what's so interesting is that <clears throat> if you ask the question, okay, um, you know, well, what is salvation? And, or what does salvation include? And, you know, you could, where do you start? Where do you jump in? Because there's many, many uh, subcategories of doctrines that we may have heard and, and may have looked at and, and understood and measured, but never really saw the connection of all of them together under the umbrella of salvation. Now there's another interesting aspect about salvation, and that is that I assume very radically that you are saved. You're in it. You're living in it. Okay? But that would be like asking the average person who is alive, you know, like, what, what is life? Uh, well, you know, well, I'm living it. Well, yes, of course, you're living it. You mean to tell me that you're living life and you don't know anything about it? <laughs> Quite a few people doing that. You know, they, they have it, but they're, you know, they don't know what they're doing with it. And believe it or not, that there can be individuals who are born again. They're going to go to heaven. They're saved. They are blood-bought. And they are living as believers, the Christian way of life, but they got the life, but they don't know what they got. And they don't know quite, you know, like, you know, how to, like if there was a secret, some, somebody, you know, people always want to know, what's the, you know, what's the secret of, of life? My dad's 92. He just turned 92 a week ago. You know, what, you know what everybody wants to ask him? Hey, what's your secret for living a long life? <laughs> you know what he said? 
She says, don't go to the hospital. <laughs> Just stay away from hospitals. You know, this is, I thought you were going to say, stay away from the graveyard. I said, how do you do that? You know, but, but still, you know, like, what, is, what is it that, that uh, we could say, if we could get something that could tell us about um, how to live uh, effectively or how to live fully, how to have full life. Here I am. I'm a human being. I have physical life. I'm on the planet. Um, all kinds of things. I'm in this life. But, but could, could you tell me a few things that, that really would, you know, make my, uh, you know, the passage and everything better? What would be key to this thing called human life? Well, the same principle I want you to see applies here that as Christians, it doesn't come automatically. You know, like there's no, there's no Cinderella to wisdom. Like you just stand there and, you know, no longer, you know, the pump 12 noon, the pumpkin goes away. It's like there is, a, there is definite keys, definite um, provisions through grace that God has given us. And why would you think that he has left the scriptures for us? Why would you think? I mean, of course, yes, people pray and the Holy Spirit is there. But God didn't just leave the Bible to get dusted in the corner somewhere. Okay. There, is, there is a unified uh, manifestation of the wisdom of God that is to be found. And it begins with the word of God. It begins with the Bible. No wonder that consistently there is an ongoing attack to resist, hinder, limit, restrict, deny, have people ignore the Bible. Oh, be religious, just ignore the Bible. Be, in, be, be emotional, just ignore the Bible. Be whatever you want to be. Be the best you can be, but just ignore the Bible. Because therein lies just some amazing keys to spiritual growth. And the goal, the objective, is spiritual maturity, or that we become like Christ experientially. Now, so to ask the question, you know, you know salvation. Well, am I saved? Well, yes, I am. Well, imagine if somebody could come up and ask you, okay, not that you're a Christian. See, because some people say, you know, well, I'm a Christian. I, I don't mean to mince words, but I really kind of try to tell them, but I'm a believer. Because if I just say I'm a Christian, here's what we found out in, in West Africa. Like, if you said that you were a Christian, and we found a lot of Christians until we figured out what was going on. And what was going on is that by saying that I was a Christian, I was really saying I'm not a Muslim. Not that I'm born again, got a relationship with Jesus Christ, going to heaven. No, just I'm, I'm not a Muslim. So what does that leave? I'm a Christian because there's only two major you know, groups in that particular country. So um, you know, beyond the, the language, okay, what are we really talking about? Well, of course, we're talking about our relationship with Jesus Christ. But we're also talking about that relationship being framed by the Word of God, that the definition and the reality and the impartation of what it is can be found through the Scriptures. That is the place. And there is no other place, okay? Um, Jesus Christ himself would say, and, and he's doing this according to the Scriptures. Even though he was the second person of the Trinity and God in the flesh, he wouldn't do anything separate and apart from in fact, he said, you know, these things, they speak of me. If you wanted to find out what I'm all, you don't even talk to me. Just whatever the scriptures say. And by the way, and that was in talking about the Old Testament. So we want to see this thing called salvation. Why? Because you're saved. I'm saved. I remember a fellow one time, he said, he said, I got saved. I said, really? So that's great. So what happened? He said, once I was blind, but now I see. 
And you know what? He's right. He's absolutely right. You know? But in a, in a, and, and, and remember, we try to put an edge on, on what we're learning. The edge is that we are, we are you know, becoming uh, apologetics. We, that we have a positive answer. We, we've got something to say. My golly, we've got something to say. See? And believe it or not, people who are seeking get all confused in a whole lot of things that they think are the similar. Okay? They get involved in mysticism or spiritualism and all these other isms, thinking that it's the same thing that you might be talking about, only probably because we're not talking very specifically. We're not talking, you know, we're not saying um, much more than maybe once I was blind and now I see, or once I was going to hell and now I'm going to heaven. And nobody could dispute any of that. But the, 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 the proof of the pudding is that, that I have categories in my thinking that I can, you know, that the man or woman of God can, you know, rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly, and I mean, and that is very precise. It's not intellectual, but it's precise. And it's going to require some upfront put in time. Okay? It just doesn't, I can't take my Bible and just rub it over my head, you know, and just to get it in there. But I can open it. And God the Holy Spirit will speak. And he is the master teacher. So I submit to that and uh, God does some amazing things. So the doctrine of salvation, is, it's the complete work of God. Not just the finished work, it is that too, of course. But it is the complete work of God. I want you to take a look at this. <clears throat> and uh, just tell me, what, tell me what you think here. I'll read that. The true doctrine of Christ is that all men must come unto him, gain faith, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, and endued in faith to the end in order to gain salvation. Is that right? What do, what do, what do, what's wrong? It has, it has Holy Ghost, it has baptized, doctrine of Christ. What, what, what's, what's wrong with that? Yeah, okay. But that's who that belongs to. The church of the what? Latter day. Latter day saints. Interesting, huh? You see words that are similar. Okay? Now, of course, I mean, it, as this is all this is all sweat and brow. This is all works. You know. You know, that come to him, gain faith. Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, endure, endure in faith to the end in order to gain. Whew, I'm tired already, just reading it. <laughs> but I want you to realize, see, people will argue with you and say, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, believe what you believe. I've seen, I've seen their... Statement of faith kind of sounds like yours a little bit, you know, all right? So that's not the time for us to crawl into a little hole and uh, retreat, but we need to really know uh, what, we're, what we're all about here. Okay, I want to take a little detour here, not a detour, but... Um, uh, if we were to study, as we are, the doctrine of salvation, um, one of the things that we would want to do is approach it in a, in a, in a systematic way. Hermeneutical. Hermeneutics. Who could tell me what that word means. Was that on our vocabulary sheet? Maybe it was. It was. Okay, good. All right. So some of you 
you didn't you didn't put a zero next to that word, so I know you know what that means. <laughs> okay, but what is what is hermeneutics? How to study the Bible? How to uh, uh, there's there's an approach, okay. And you know sometimes we might exaggerate in terms of. Well, let me put it this way: there's there's the extreme end of having some sort of mechanical uh, structure in terms of approaching the Bible that is not spiritual, because this is not a matter of academics. All right, but it is a matter of discipline. Then you have the other end of the spectrum of the way in which people would approach God and approach the Bible. And pretty much for them, it, it, it just, you know, like they could throw the thing open and just kind of point to a scripture and say, God is speaking to me through this verse. And they might do that two or three times in a week using the Bible to determine what decisions they, that we make. So you have two extremes here, and I don't want you to think that, that there isn't a true middle, because there is. Okay. And one of the basis of proper hermeneutics is that this has been tried and true. This has been, um, you know, this is not something come up. And one of the things that, that we're going to see later in this course is that when certain movements arise and they, they take on this big popularity thing, more than likely what you find out is that they have neglected the historical basis of the scriptures and how they were approached. In other words, they throw, they throw the, the bathwater out and there goes the baby. They, they reject the fact that, that something has come before, that something has already been evaluated and, and reviewed and, and prayed about. And their start, it's like trying to start building a building on the 14th floor. You just can't do that. There is a foundation. And there's no other foundation, the scriptures tell us, that other than Jesus Christ and him crucified and, and the, the prophets. He is the chief cornerstone. We understand that. But then in, sec, in 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about be careful then, but how you build upon that foundation. Be careful. There's a real admonition there. And hermeneutics are guidelines. They just help me to check and make sure, did I touch base here? Did I do that there? And then, okay. So, one of the principles, all right, of uh, hermeneutics is first case of mention. First case of mention. So, what are we studying? Salvation. Well, where would I find the first instance of it being mentioned in the scriptures? Do I want to start in, in the epistles of Paul? Well, no. I mean, they're going to correlate, but it's important for me to realize that that the, the 66 books of the Bible is one book. See? There, God didn't make a mistake and just decide to change his mind when he got to the New Testament. And the Old Testament will never contradict the New Testament, and the New Testament will never contradict the Old Testament. But it will reveal the whole categorical thinking of God, and that's what we want to have. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 49, and there's a verse that we'll look at there. And let's take this, take this right on the nose here. Genesis chapter 49. And we're going to see here. Now I want us to keep in mind these principles that we're talking about are consistent and important to know. for our approach to studying the scriptures. Now, <clears throat> first of all, no scripture 
is for any private interpretation. What is a safeguard against a private interpretation? It's actually up on the screen. What's the word there? Context. context. Okay. What's the context? What's the setting? What's going on at the time? All right? And if I don't check that, then I can actually lift a verse or a portion right out of the Bible and have it say just exactly what I want it to say rather than what it's truly saying. So, Q and DQ, qualified or disqualified. Um, the context, in what I'm thinking, can either be qualified or disqualified by the context. The content is salvation. We're studying salvation. So what we need to do is back up a little bit in Genesis 49. Who can tell me what's going on here? What's the context of our verse? Go ahead. Jacob is dying. Yes, okay. And what, what, is, what, is, uh, what is the agenda here? What's going on? He's got who? Who's in his audience? Twelve. Who are those guys? Begins with a P. Yes, the patriarchs. <laughs> Doc, this is a pivotal, pivotal time. Because from what, what Jacob is going to say to these twelve sons is going to happen. Now, what do we say when someone is speaking of future events. They are what? Prophesying. Okay. But it also doesn't mean just exclusively only future events. The word itself also includes a present proclamation. Or in other words, it's, you know, the technical use of the word is that I'm prophesying right now. Now, I'm not telling you all about the future. I think you'd like to tell me, you know, like, am I going to get an A in the class? That's up to you. <laughs> but the proclaiming and communication also comes under this heading. And that's important. All right? So Jacob called unto his sons, and gather yourselves together, this is in verse 1, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So here he is, he is the priest of the family. And here he is, and he is operating in his priesthood. He is now going to declare prophetically what will happen to each of the sons. That is the con. Text. So right now, we could look at what is said and see some significance about our verse in verse 18. So uh, it's very interesting because as he goes through each of, the, of his sons and... Uh, Notice in verse 16, so he says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel so that his rider shall fall backward. That's an interesting statement. Well, what it was was that <clears throat> Dan was going to be the tribe that was going to initiate the split between the various tribes, the two tribes and the ten splitting. And Jacob says here shall be like a serpent getting in the way, an adder, that's a snake, in the path so that his rider shall fall back. Then right after that statement, now he's talking about a particular son and a particular tribe, then right after that, he says in verse 18, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Does that seem to be like a continuity of flow, or does that seem to be like a standout statement? 
The standout statement, yeah. And I think it's like we see that as he's talking about Dan and what that will mean down the line is that he realizes that the only thing that's going to change it is a Savior. And he gets a revelation here that there's a salvation that comes from God. And this is the first instance of which the word, and we're going to see which word it is in just a few minutes, is mentioned. Now, so we have the context, prophecy, divine communication through Jacob, and he's saying this. What is the context? Well, the word actually will define the context. The content, rather. There's two words in the Hebrew that you'll see translated salvation or savior. The first, hey, I got my thing, just a minute. Yasha. Yasha. And Yasha. is a verb. It's a verb. This word we'll see describes actions of saving or actions of rescuing. In other words, something's taking place. The other word that we'll find is Yeshua. And that's a good name for a son, Joshua, okay, or Jesus, which is the Greek transliteration. And this word now is not a verb, but it is a noun. Person, place, or thing. That's what nouns are, right? Okay. So right away, and you can see, I could read the word salvation, and if I didn't know whether it was a verb or a noun, it, I'd, get, I'd get kind of confused. I could come up with a doctrine that wasn't necessarily biblical. All right? So, let's continue. Here it is. Yasha. The first four references of this word in the Old Testament 149 times is translated save. 15 times is translated savior. 13 times deliver, help. This is a verb, and this is what we said already, denoting action in time. But the issue here, see, we'll see this word here. Now, in the, in the ancient Hebrew word, anyone who would come to help, help you out, help carry something, or help uh, straighten something out. The, the illustration here uh, was when Moses was by the well and uh, nomads came and they started chasing off women. He came and chased them off. He came under the category of being their savior. Well, maybe we would say today he, he, he was their hero, okay? He was their helper. So just because I see this word does not mean that there's a reference to anything happening spiritually, but it certainly can mean that somebody's helping out and doing, doing some things. Same thing with deliver, okay? So this is the word that's used denoting action and end time. But now we see Yeshua. And here now, 65 times, it's translated with this word, salvation. Four times, help. See, similar. Three times here for deliverance. I think I'm missing a number. I think that's what the problem is there. But I want you to see that 
there's similarities because they, of course, are the same root word, but the difference between this one, this one is a what? Verb. This one is a? All right. This word, Yeshua, speaks of a person who is, and this is so key, qualified, qualified for these actions. And we'll pick this up as we go through the various doctrines. In other words, someone who may like to help but is not qualified to help. Uh, I remember we were bringing some groceries in, and, uh, <laughs> and as I was going out to get the bags out of the van, here comes my grandson. He's got the loaf of bread. And he's just dragging that thing right along, you know, just to get it in the house. He had to, he had to get it out of the bag. <laughs> and, and, but he wanted to help. And he was my little savior. You know, but was he qualified? Well, no, I mean, it was a couple big bags and he couldn't do a thing with that. All right? So we'll see that, that when we get to, dis, to studying who the Messiah is, that that person has to fulfill specific qualifications. He's going to be that one who will be the Savior, all right? Well, he's got to be qualified to do that. Not just willing, not just available, qualified. And we'll see this, okay? In fact, um, go to your handout to... Uh, the Messiah. And let's just take a look at this. This is from uh, Tracy Rich. He runs a uh, Judaism 101 website. And we are indebted to him for this material. But I want you to see, now this is, this is and he says, this is the orthodox Jewish view of who the Savior, Messiah, is to be. And it's very interesting because the only reference that they have, of course, is the Old Testament. All right? And we, as believers, we can see Christ in the Old Testament. There's some great books, by the way, <clears throat> that just specifically go into uh, various passages where, of course, it's speaking of the Messiah, but we see, we see Jesus. I mean, it's just like now we just don't see. Well, notice what it says here. So, first of all, uh, the Messiah will be a great political leader descended from King David. So, genealogically, he has to come from a specific family line, and we understand that as well. All right? The Messiah is often referred to as Messiah ben David or Messiah son of David. He will be well-versed in Jewish law and observant of its commandments, according to Isaiah 11, 2 through 5. He will be a charismatic leader, inspiring others to follow his example. He will be a great military leader who will, who will win battles for Israel. He will be a great judge who will make righteous decisions in Jeremiah 33, 15. But above all, he will be a human being, not a god, demigod, or other supernatural being. Now that's what an Orthodox Jewish person thinks. When you say Messiah, he's thinking this. He's looking for what? A political reformer. He's looking for what? A <clears throat> one that would give moral inspiration. He's looking for what? A, per, a human being. Now, of course, we understand that the Antichrist, okay, will put on, take on the appearance of a man. And, you know, you kind of say, like, well, how could, you know, we kind of get the panoramic view. How could, how could this guy get in and deceive Jewish people, not just the Jewish people, but the whole world. How could this person step out on the human history and people will just flock and just like, and it'll actually get to the point where 
they will think that uh, he is so uh, appropriate that he is to be worshipped. And so we're going to see how a Jewish, the Jewish mindset is looking for this. They're expecting this. All right. Then, when will Messiah come? There are a wide variety of opinions on this subject. When the Messiah will come, some of Judaism's greatest minds have cursed those who've tried to predict the time of the Messiah's coming because errors in such predictions could cause people to lose faith in the Messianic idea or in Judaism itself. This actually happened in the 17th century when Shabbatai Tizva claimed to be the Messiah. When Tizva converted to Islam under the threat of death, many Jews converted with him. Nevertheless, this prohibition has not stopped anyone from speculating about the time when the Messiah will come. Now, notice, look at the qualifications here, or look at what is the criteria that is used here <clears throat> as to when this particular person, human being now, will come. Although some scholars believe that God has set aside a specific date for the coming of the Messiah, most authorities suggest that the conduct of mankind, the conduct of mankind will determine the time of the Messiah's coming. In general, it is believed that the Messiah will come in a time when he is most needed because the world is so sinful, or in a time when he is most deserved because the world is so good. For example, each of the following has been suggested as the time when the Messiah will come. It will come when Israel repented a single, in a single day. And they will, by the way. If Israel observed a single Shabbat properly, or Sabbath properly, that means that the temple would have to be restored. This is talking about uh, the restoration, animal sacrifice, uh, as it was previously in Israel history. If Israel observed two Sabbaths in a row properly, in a generation that is totally innocent or totally guilty, by what measurement, we don't know. Or he'll come in a generation that loses hope, or in a generation where children are totally disrespectful towards their parents and elders, that's, hey, that's today. So interesting, see, if we were to talk to a respected Orthodox rabbi, this is his mindset, this is, this is what he's saying, this is um, a, a helper. See, he's, he's actually very, uh, very much adhering to this, this word here, okay, and that this would be a literal person, human being, not God, not a super being, who will save from whatever political problems we have, uh, deliver from the economic straits that people would be in, and would be this amazing helper. You know, have the answers to the questions that the world is struggling with. And, uh, and he would be called Yasha a savior, all right? Now, I think it's just interesting that you have a major, major religion in the world today, and this is how they think, okay? So what if you were to ask them the question, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? Well, if they're not looking for God, and they're looking for a man, then their answer would be, he doesn't qualify. See? And we might be stuck if we just left off at that, at that point. But I think that, see, Good hermeneutics would take us, and we could cite this word and understand the qualifications. Notice that what he, what's said here 
is that the thing that would determine the Messiah coming would be that um, that person would actually be uh, no, no, not the person. Here it is. Okay. <clears throat> Second paragraph, the time is right for the messianic age within the person's lifetime, then that person will be the Messiah. But if the person dies before completing the mission of the Messiah, then that person is not the Messiah. See, it's interesting. So what do they say? They say, Jesus died, and he did. But what is it that they don't acknowledge, of course, is the resurrection. So you see, there's con there can be these historical connections that are not, they, they, they kind of like overlap one another, okay? So a Jewish person would say, oh, I, Jesus was a real person. I mean, you know, historically, he, he, you know, he lived, I know his family, and, and so forth, his genealogy, and uh, yeah, but he died. End of line, okay? And whether or not uh, you could talk to them about resurrection would be kind of futile because they are not looking for deity to return. But this would be someone who would be born on the planet, born of a woman, born, not a supernatural birth, but born of regular human descent. Okay? So that's why it says it has been said that in every generation a person is born with the potential to be Messiah, you know, um, there, are, there are those that believe that Jesus, <clears throat> uh, they discredit the virgin birth, the supernatural birth of Jesus Christ. And what they say is that, well, he just had a natural birth just like anyone else did. And that uh, as he was growing up and going, you know, to the synagogue and learning, it, he began to progressively think that Perhaps he would be, or could be, he could be maybe the Messiah. And when enough people like encouraged him or said the right things to him, and, and he would uh, uh, you know, try in a way to fulfill Scripture, well then, then he accepted, you know, that he would then accept the fact that he was the Messiah. But it wasn't that Jesus Christ was eternal and came and entered into time as the Messiah. <clears throat> in other words, he's just as much the Messiah in the cradle as he was on the cross. They won't accept that because they don't accept the supernatural virgin birth, the incarnation, see. And these doctrines, see, are great structures to keep, our, keep us straight on this kind, because you can get in a conversation, and again, the language is similar, but the reference is entirely different. Uh, so, now I want to uh, have us see something here. What are we talking about? The scope. Oh, yep, it's 7.30. Uh, that's good. Let's take a 15-minute break. <clears throat> we'll come back and we'll jump right into uh, the other handouts that we have. Those folks that, if, if your name was up on the screen, could you come see me please right now? And uh, we'll get that done and out of the way. <clears throat> 